opportunity to be here today. Uh, I believe I first testified before this committee during the consideration of OPA 90 when I was a, a, a local government official. I was working uh, to, to help make sure we had the infrastructure after a major oil spill. Uh, in the early 2000s, as a, a commissioner on the Arctic Research Commission, was the first of several times I've been before this committee to say we needed icebreakers. Uh, working with uh, uh, Admiral Allen when he was commandant uh, uh, to try to help make that happen. It's good to see it happening today, and thank you for your continuing attention on this issue. As your wrap-up batter today, let me just talk about the issue of how do you actually get the infrastructure we need in the Arctic. And I've got three basic ideas that I wanted to share with you. I want to make sure that it's understood that these are my ideas or the opinions that I express are my own, not the Wilson Center. I do co-chair the Polar Program at the Wilson Center, and uh, we are holding a major symposium with the National Ice Center and the U.S. Arctic Research Commission in July, uh, to which you are all invited. But uh, the first thing I'd like to say is that we're, you're constantly being asked to appropriate funds for Arctic infrastructure. And whether it's icebreakers uh, or uh, that might be justified by security or economic development, uh, the problem that I see is that our security plans, our civil plans, our commercial plans all identify the need for the same thing, ports, charting, communications. But we still have stovepipes that don't really work together to figure out how to pay it. Now, we do have CMTS, which is a cross-government effort to look at the marine transportation system, but it doesn't include the state government, which can bring significant resources to the table as well. And I want to appreciate the work that CMTS has done uh, in the Arctic, but I just want to say we need to get away from this. And a couple of examples. When you heard the Coast Guard say today that we have floating bases with these new, uh, with these new icebreakers, that's, that's tremendous but it's leaving the civil authorities who need to finance ports to kind of act on their own. And we really should be working together to get the military, uh, uh, the security issues covered, as well as the civil and commercial issues covered. Uh, when you heard the question on telecommunications, the same issue, uh, I, I chair an advisory board for Iridium. We've got 66 new satellites operating, a 360 by 360 process that works and serves the military. And this is something where the commercial needs and the security needs can be answered together. The second point I want to make is that when it comes to finding revenue, especially to pay for icebreakers, when the Admiral and I were serving together, it cost something between 60 and $80 million a year to run our icebreaker program. Now, the Russians are charging half a million dollars to go across the Arctic Ocean per ship. Uh, so to make up $80 million is 160 ships. That's one ship a day during the open navigation season. All right. Uh, Senator Murkowski, Senator Sullivan have proposed a bill which the Wilson Center has worked on. I worked on developing it as chair of the Arctic Circle uh, Mission Council on Shipping and Ports, which says let's create an Arctic Seaway Development Corporation very similar to the St. Lawrence Seaway Corporation, which exists in, in Congressman Gibbs' district. And the St. Lawrence Seaway approach uh, would, has, several nation, has two nations working together. We could have several nations working together in the Arctic to put together a seamless uh, system to get people across the Arctic Ocean. And that concept is uh, well described in S1177, but Mr. Chairman, I guess I'd put it this way. Uh, when we come ask you for money for icebreakers and talk about inbound Arctic shipping, it's not really American taxpayers' job so, to pay the bill so China can sell goods to France. It's our job to set up a system so that tariffs and revenue can come in to help pay for those icebreakers, and that's the concept in that legislation. Mr. Chairman, finally, the third thing I'd like to say in terms of paying for Arctic infrastructure is it's a lot easier to pay something for something when there's more economic activity. Now, there was a large push during... Uh, uh, the Bush and the Obama administrations to make OCS uh, drilling work offshore. There was expectations that that was going to help pay for the major ports in the Arctic. It didn't happen uh, for, for whatever reasons, and we can discuss those. But I, I would predict that the next big wave of economic activity, the Russians already shown us how to do. They're bringing 16 and a half million tons of LNG from Yamal through the Bering Strait, 2,600 miles through the ice, to get there while we've got big fields at Prudhoe Bay and the Canadians have a big field at the McKinsey Delta that are lying fallow. Now, 
if uh, this is not something that requires congressional appropriation, but it does require congressional and diplomatic attention. And with that opportunity, I predict that sometime in the, by the end of the next decade, you're going to see maybe as much as 50 million tons a year of LNG moving out of Russia, maybe as much as 30 to 40 million tons of LNG a year moving out of Alaska and, and the Canadian uh, McKinsey Delta. And I believe that relatively benign economic activity, which, you gotta, uh, which has a lower carbon impact than, than some of the fuels being used in Asia today, uh, is, is going to help bring the economic activity necessary to pay for the infrastructure. So I would just urge you to pay attention. Mr. Thank Chairman, you, thank you very much for your time. Thanks, gentlemen.